ready to go. I mean, ready basically go. you're ready. Uh, yeah, I know you have this um, interesting challenge coming up and I'm yeah. curious what you're gonna do to reset in the hours. It The, the frequency of running is um, every four hours. It's not gonna allow you to get any more than a couple hours sleep in between. A couple hours, so we should we should tell to people, I'd be curious to get your thoughts and advice on it. I'm, uh, on March 5th, running 48 miles with Mr. David Goggins. So four miles every four hours and people should join us. He's, uh, that madman is going to be live on Instagram starting at 8 p.m. Pacific on March 5th. So- You're gonna join him in person. In person. Undisclosed location. Undisclosed location. So <laughs> and I was, I was trying to clarify like, okay, so we're gonna like, There'll be like friendly people around or something. No, it's just me and him. Friendly and people. I don't know. Like, <laughs> I just feel it's very difficult to be with David alone in a room. I imagine his, I mean, I've done some work with David. His energy is infectious. Yeah. I don't, I don't, that, that's an intense schedule. Um, and the the periodicity of the, those four hour, every four hours, four miles means that there's no chance of catching an extended block of sleep. So it's about three hours that you have non-exercising every time. And of course, it takes time to try to fall asleep and there's an intensity to the whole thing. You, I mean, it's probably impossible to get anything more than uh, two hours of sleep if you wanted to. So the optimal thing is probably from the sound of it, I'd be curious to see what you think, but like it's getting a few 90 minute naps. Okay, well, I thought about this a bit before we met up today. So I think there are two general approaches that could work, neither one necessarily better than the other. One would be just to hammer through the whole thing, just to get your level of alertness and adrenaline ramped up so that you don't expect yourself to sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, there are certain advantages there. One is a subjective kind of emotional advantage, which is if you can't sleep, you're not gonna be stressed about that. Yes. And if you do fall asleep, it's a bonus, yeah. provided you wake up and you don't look up and you realize David's been out running for half an hour and you're behind, right? Yeah. But chances are that's not the way it'll go. You set an alarm. So that's one approach. Yeah. And and I grabbed that from, you know, I have a couple of friends who were um who were in the SEAL teams and they'll say that, you know, during BUDS there's this infamous hell week and there's this five hour five days, excuse me, definitely five days of no sleep. Although there is a component where they offer a nap at one particular point. And a lot of people will say that it's worse to go down for that nap and then be woken up 20 minutes later than to just stay up. Yeah. So, so that's one option. Let's call it the um, full blitz hammer through option. And if you happen to fall asleep, you do. Bonus. Yeah. It's a bonus. The other one would be to really anchor in these ultradian cycles. So coming back from a run, you unless you're thoroughly exhausted, you're probably going to have a few minutes where you're gonna to wanna to stay awake. It's gonna be hard to just immediately fall asleep and getting as much sleep as you can in the intervening periods, provided that you guys aren't posting constantly or doing something else. You also, this is a question of whether or not you wanna nourish, whether or not you wanna eat or not in that time. Anytime we put food in our gut, I don't care if it's meat or oatmeal or broccoli or cardboard, you're drawing blood into the gut. And so you are going to divert some energy towards digestion and it's gonna make you sleepy. There's a reason why the rest and digest, the parasympathetic nervous system is called that. So you could decide that you were only gonna sleep in certain in between certain blocks. That would be another way to think about this. So that, because I did this last year, uh, I ran very slow. Some of it was walking. I was listening to audiobooks, And one of the biggest mistakes I did is to, overeat during that time. Right. It was, uh, it made the experience very unpleasant. So I, I have been considering basically eating almost nothing throughout the day. Being fasted will increase alertness because high levels of epinephrine in your system from fasting. You just think about fasting or being thirsty before you get exhausted. People always think if I don't eat, I'm gonna be tired. No, the, the energy that you derive from food is going to be uh, used from glycogen and after a long storage and conversion process. So the food that you eat is going to consume energy to digest. And so a lot of people feel better fasted and presumably throughout history, people have fasted for long periods of time and had to stay up for two or three days. And, you know, God forbid, if a family member is sick, you can stay awake in the hospital without any trouble. So that alertness system, and it's, you know, it's all mental. Um, 
actually, and then there's a third. So you could try and sleep or or take care in between. Yes. Yeah. And then there's a third approach. Uh oh. Yeah. But I didn't come up with it. What, what but, is but it? But David did. Okay. So uh, I actually texted him <laughs> oh, no. earlier because I had a feeling that I heard that you were going to do this challenge. So I asked David. Oh, um, God. <laughs> so these are David Goggins' words, not mine. Okay. One. <laughs> okay. Being organized is super important. Two. You want to waste as little time as possible. Three, you need to eat, sleep, and rehab in as little time as possible so you can sleep as much as possible. Oh, interesting. By the way, this is the first time I'm reading this. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> four, meal prep and gear prep, et cetera, are very important. That's um, that's consistent with everything I know about military. They they don't they don't leave too much to chance. Five, again, these are David's words. All that said, he's fucked on most all that because he'll be interviewing me before or after. I will also be interviewing him. Oh, shit. Five, long story short, the only thing that might help is a very special pill. Ooh, this is interesting. <laughs> They're called SIU pills. Hard to get, but I believe he can get them. SIU stands for suck it up. <laughs> Tell him to grab his balls. Yeah. He will find those pills there. <laughs> That's number six. All right. <laughs> and then the last one. Yeah. Stay hard, brother. Stay hard, brother. Amen. I, you know, that was one of the other things that I think makes this challenging is that it'll be doing a podcast throughout. So first of all, I'll do a long one before and after, but also I'll have to come up with things to talk to him about. Mm -hmm. So like, it's, it's a different thing to do something privately. Mm -hmm. And then publicly, I know it doesn't seem that way, but like one of the hardest, the hardest thing I had to do last time was to turn on the camera and talk to the camera. Cause I, uh, last time I did it, I recorded um, every single time I did a leg, I recorded something I'm grateful for. It's just kind of unrelated. I'm not a fan of like talking about like how I'm feeling or how the run is going. I want to do something totally unrelated to the run and with the run as the background, you know, so, mm -hmm. sort of something I'm grateful for, just any kind of uh, interesting discussion. Gratitude, I mean, I hate the word hack, like, oh, it's a dopamine hack or it's a serotonin. I, I don't like the word hack because A, it's disrespectful to hackers who do a real thing. Yeah. And B, a hack it implies that it's some sort of trick that you're 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 kind of gaming the system. You know, what what works is mechanism, right? Biological mechanisms, were designed to work be, and they were selected for to work under variable conditions. And as you know, and I know, and we have great appreciation for the fact that the nervous system was designed to be an adaptive machine so that you don't have to sleep eight hours every night. Yeah. You can do this thing. And things like gratitude allow you to tap into chemical resources and that's not a hack. The, the fact that being grateful for something external to the event happens to release serotonin and have a certain soothing effect or uh, dopamine and give you more epinephrine and let you go further. That's not a hack. That's actually what allowed the human machine to evolve to the point that it is now. Mm -hmm. Every time, you know, an inventor eventually created something that worked and felt great about it. You can imagine that the, the first, you know, air flight felt pretty awesome and motivated those people to go on and do more. They, they didn't just go, oh, you know, yawn and go have a beer. So being able to access the genuine in, internal states of gratitude and reward works. You can't trick the system. You can't pretend that you're grateful for something, but if you can identify or attach yourself to some larger goal or something that's deeply gratifying to you or place it in service to, a relative that passed away that you care a lot about, that's not a hack. That's accessing the deepest components of your nervous system. And um, to steal your kind of lingo, you know, there's real beauty there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but for an introvert like myself, and I think David, I don't know if he's an introvert, but like he's not, despite the fact that he has written a great book and he communicates, he puts himself out there, he's not really a fan of, communication. He's not, I don't know if he's energized by speaking his mind. Uh, I don't know him well enough to know. I mean, we've done a little bit of work together and, um, you know, we're in communication now and again, he's obviously super impressive. Um, 
I don't know. It seems that he's a pretty, it seems like he's a pretty private guy. Yeah. Um, so I, like, you I, know, so I don't have access to that. So for me, I'll just speak to myself and I think David is the same, but I'll speak to myself that it was a hugely draining thing, not to experience the gratitude, experiencing the gratitude, just like you're saying is really energizing. And it's, it's a powerful thing. It's a, it's a, it can lift up your mood, but to turn on the camera and have to, use words, which is very difficult to do, to explain like what you're feeling and do it in a way that you know a bunch of people will be watching is really draining. And one of the things I'm concerned about that in this whole process, how do I keep my mind sharp while also keeping the perform the physical performance sharp? And, that's a little bit scary because talking to David, like actual intellectually sharp, like thinking, being charismatic and <laughs> as much as I can be, and like being still maintaining a sense of humor too, because I can be, I, I become with sleep deprivation, with exhaustion, you start being- uh, The Russian bear comes out. You start being <laughs> such a, like you, I become a David Goggins essentially, like- Oh, it makes you irritable. Sleep deprivation makes us irritable. The, yeah, there's, it's clear. So that in the early part of the night, we get a higher percentage of those old tradian cycles are occupied by slow wave sleep, mm -hmm. sometimes just called non-REM sleep. And those early night sleep bouts are great for muscular repair and for certain forms of learning. But REM sleep, the rapid eye movement sleep, which it starts to accumulate and occupy more of those 90 minute old tradian cycles toward the late part of a sleep bout. So toward typically toward morning, um, but toward after you've been asleep a while, that's when you do the emotional processing. That's when we recover the ability to feel refreshed and not irritated by things. And if you deprive people of REM sleep, they become selectively uh, bad at, at uncoupling the emotion from things that happened in the previous days. So the little things start to seem like big things. I always know I'm REM sleep deprived when um, I'm irritable and when um, I look at like the word the, and it doesn't look like it's spelled right, and I'm kind of pissed off about it. Yeah. Like something's off. And we actually are becoming slightly um, psychotic when we're REM sleep deprived. You're not gonna get a lot of REM sleep in this thing, except as you fatigue more, if you do fall asleep, you're gonna drop more and more into REM so that those 90 minute cycles, you won't have to go through stage one, stage two, stage three, and then REM. You're just gonna drop right into REM. So you can count on your system to compensate for you. But I think that, just the knowledge that you tend to get irritable as the time goes on, just that third personing of yourself and yes. that awareness, the observer, that can be very beneficial because in, there may be bouts during this event when you just should probably say nothing. And maybe you just, um, I don't know, smile and record or not smile or do do whatever it is because you're, you're gonna be conserving energy. If it feels like a grind, that's epinephrine being released. That's epinephrine that you could devote to the physical effort. But humor is an amazing anecdote for this because it resets that, it's that dopamine release that gives us that fresh perspective. And it's a, it's a real chemical thing. It's not a, it's not a hack, it's not a, it's not a trick, it's not a visualization, it's biology in action. Well, but I think the act of uh, interviewing, of conversation in these processes, even if you don't wanna do it, the right thing to do, even when you're feeling irritable, is to to do the third person view and be able to express with words that you're feeling irritable. Like express what you're going through, Ex you know, uh, use words, which I hate doing. I honestly, I think my ultimate thing would be just to never say a single word to David Goggins and just go through hell. It doesn't matter what we do, but to do it quietly, to also express it that's my ultimate hell. And well, I think he's that's... definitely going to be, if I know David at all, he's, he's going to try and find your buttons. Like he's going <laughs> to, he, I mean, he, even though he knows he can complete this yeah. and I, I believe that he trusts that you can complete it too. I, I believe you can, you will yeah, complete yeah. it. You know, you will complete yeah. it. Right. There's no question about that, but he's not going to make it easier for you. He's going to make it harder. Well, I'm afraid. So I'm like, you know, it's very difficult for me. So 48 miles is not easy. I have not been training that much. So I'm now ramping up but it's not like going to kill me. We'll see what happens. Of course, for him, he might almost get bored because I think the 48 miles for him is easy. I think 
I don't Not, know that, that I don't know that that ever gets easy. I have a friend, uh, Casey Cordial, who works with David. He's uh, does some um, physical uh, rehab type stuff with him, and he took Casey on a fifty miler. And Casey said it's like sixteen miles into it, he was just like he hit his wall. Yeah, but they yeah. he found it. They they find it together. You know, you find that portal.